Welcome everyone to OEN Engage 2024. Thank you for joining us for today's session, which is Train the Trainer Intro to OER Adoption. My name is Tanya Groz, and I'm the Director of Educational Programs for the OEN, and I'm thankful that you are here today. Uh, I do have a few housekeeping uh, items before we get going. Uh, this morning or yesterday morning, we kicked off the week with an OEN land acknowledgement and the OEN community norms. Uh, if you'd like to review them, you can find them at the links that I'll post in the chat in a second. Um, I'm coming to you from the unceded Dakota lands of St. Paul, Minnesota. We welcome you to share your local land acknowledgement in the chat if you'd wish to do so. Or feel free to visit the Native Land Digital site to learn about the lands that our community members inhabit and dig a little deeper into our relationship with their heritage, the resources that they share, and how we can actively be a part of a better future moving forward. This session is being recorded to benefit those in our community who are unable to attend or need to leave early, and the links will be shared out after the event. If you have comments or questions during the session, please submit them via the chat and we will do our best to address them. And now please join me in welcoming today's presenters, Cheryl Casey, Open Education Librarian for the University of Arizona, and Maggie Mapes, Faculty Member and Introductory Course Director in the Department of Communication Studies for the University of Kansas. Thank you, Tanya. Uh, so welcome, everybody. We're so glad you could join us this morning. Uh, this is the Train the Trainer uh, presentation that Maggie and I have been doing for consortia and systems when they join the Open Education Network. Um, we want you to see how it works. These slides are, of course, openly licensed so that you can adapt them for your own workshops. Uh, this is a suggested citation. Now, I'll say that typically we do this as a three-hour workshop. Today, we have just under two hours, so we have eliminated some of the content, like the introduction to the Open Education Network and detailed instructions for participants, um, and uh, we've shortened some of the activity times. Next slide, please. Yeah, so uh, Tanya has already introduced us. Thank you. I'll let Ma Maggie, Maggie pop on camera real fast just to uh, say hi. And... Hi, everyone. It's, it's, oh, I'm here. Sorry. I am I got too excited. I got way too excited. I'm just, just wanting to say hi. I'm so happy to be here this morning. Um, and again, thank you. Thank you, Tanya, for that great introduction. Thanks. Yeah, so um, I'm going to kick us off here. And... Um, yeah, let's get going. And if you would like to share in the chat um, who you are and where you're from, please go ahead and do that. Um, we typically also allow time during the train the trainer for the system or consortia leaders to introduce themselves and uh, to to share any information that they want. Okay, next slide, please. So this is our goal today, to equip you with tools, techniques, and strategies to build and sustain open education initiatives on your own campus or at your own institution. Oh, great. I'm glad people are putting their hellos in the chat. Thank you. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so in our time together, we are going to uncover barriers to open textbook adoption discuss strategies for raising awareness and educating and engaging. We're gonna practice successful strategies for responding to those difficult questions. Um, if we have time, we'll touch on ways to incentivize faculty engagement with open textbooks, but likely today we won't have time to do that. And then we'll try to save some time for Q&A. Um, this is a, a time for us to share and build community. So please take care of your needs. Um, we have eliminated the break that we usually do, um, but uh, take care of your needs as, as we go through these next two hours. All right, next slide, please. Um, we do have this activity guide and I'll drop the link in the chat. Um, let's see, we'll move on to the next slide that shows how to make a copy of it. Yeah, so if you just go to file, make a copy. Um, this is an optional activity guide that you can use in your trainings. 
uh, it's got the activities laid out, um, but you can also encourage people just to use their own devices or to um, just write on a, a piece of paper. But it's, this is a read-only file, so yeah, making a copy. All right, next slide. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, you're already ahead of me. So yesterday, uh, Dave Ernst uh, gave a great opening kickoff session talking about the work of this community. And uh, I love the big heart. This is my my favorite community. Um, so many generous, warm people who are just fabulous. Um, so he talked about the strategies, best practices, shared solutions, and the actions that you know are available to uh, us as community members, things like the Pub 101 uh, curriculum, um, the adoption workshops, uh, all of the community hub resources, the guides, the templates, the uh, the certificate programs to build expertise, and the colleague connector program to exchange expertise. And then the shared solutions like the open textbook library. Every time I log into it, it's bigger and bigger. And yay, congratulations on exceeding 1,500 books. You know, these shared uh, slide decks and the uh, the data dashboards. And then great opportunities like this, OEN Engage, and of course the listserv. So um, yeah, it's... Uh, as a community, we can accomplish so much more together than we can separately. And I just love this community. All right, next slide, please. So as we know, this work is incredibly rewarding, but it also has its challenges. And uh, this is an activity that participants really seem to embrace when we do these trainings. Um, it helps them, I think, realize that they're not alone in some of the challenges that they face. Um, so next slide, please. Um, what we do is encourage them to reflect on barriers that keep faculty from adopting open textbooks. And so this, fa this exercise works with faculty, it works with OER program leaders, it works with administrators. Um, and using the activity guide or just a blank piece of paper, um, we encourage you to take two minutes, it's usually five, but today we'll do two minutes to reflect on those barriers. And we call this a brain dump or unclogging the pipes, just writing down as many things as you can think of, um, going for quantity as it says, you know, there's no right or wrong answers. Uh, so I will be quiet now and give you two minutes to just write down as many barriers as you can think of. I'm seeing some great answers already in the chat. Um, so we're going to split you into breakout rooms. And typically, in the three-hour version of this um, training, we, we do 15 minutes in the breakout. Today, we're going to shorten it to 10 minutes, just so you can get a feel for how this activity works. We're going to skip the introductions. But that's a really important part if you're doing this training to build community. Uh, and uh, so, yeah. Um, Maggie is going to divide you into breakout rooms and we'll have you share what you wrote down and um, encourage you to look for commonalities as well as differences. Welcome back. We see people trickling in. We'll give some of the other rooms a chance to close. Looks like everybody's back. All right. Well, I hope that was a good activity um, and you enjoyed talking together and, and uh, feeling less alone in this uh, challenging work. Um, typically what we do is ask people when they come back from the breakout rooms to put in the chat some of the, the things that they discussed. Um, we have a lot of people here today, which is fantastic. Um, uh, so it may overwhelm the chat, but we're going to do it anyway. Uh, yeah, go ahead and just type a few things in the chat. Yay, Kathy, got to meet someone new, uh, brand new to open, which is so exciting. 
Yeah, that's a, a really important part of these breakout rooms and this training is to build that community and um, yeah, meet new people. Did you find a lot of commonalities? Did you find a lot of differences in what your challenges were? Oh, good. Liza got uh, totally new to open education, got paired with two veterans. Like I said, this is such a fantastic community. And uh, yeah, just being able to talk and share and get that support is so important. Feels validating, Anne-Marie. Yes, it really does. Like, okay, other other people know what I'm going through. And, you know, we can also talk about shared solutions. Oh, t uh, tensions between faculty using OER and faculty who publish textbooks in their field. Yes, yes, we definitely have some faculty here who rely on that income. <laughs> Relationship building, Adrian says, yeah, yeah. And when people leave, um, you get to start all over. Uh, Janelle says, ignorance, uh, yeah, just the, the lack of awareness. Um, I kicked off an OER training uh, asking <laughs> for, you know, people's familiarity with OER. And uh, was somebody who responded, what's OER? <laughs> so, yes, definitely, definitely can relate to that. No institutional funding, yes, can definitely relate to that as well. Yeah, um, funding, lack of awareness, time, um, all of these are really, really common barriers that come up in training after training. Um, so Mickey, let's go on to the next slide. Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, these are all real challenges, very common challenges. The good news is that there are ways to address them. And so I'm going to pass things off to Maggie now to um, explain more. Yes, thank you all so, so much. And, you know, I really encourage each of you that even if you have a pretty substantial individual list of barriers, to take a moment to make note of things in your group that you heard, to see things that you need in the chat, so that in the future, when you all take the, these workshops and really apply them to your own campuses, you have that opportunity to begin planning and strategizing ways to overcome or to think about how you can engage with some of those barriers. Um, and that's really what we're going to kind of transition to talking with you now. Because again, all of those barriers are real and we do a number of things to address the challenges that you brainstormed. The, the workshop, the OER adoption workshop is really meant to equip faculty and staff with tools to instill participants on their campus with education, awareness, and engagement. And that's really the kind of three-pronged strategy. We try to raise awareness. So an example of raising awareness with folks on your campus is, for example, just sharing an email that includes a link to an OER or, or um, for me, I often will send out the open textbook library link to my colleagues as I know they're planning for future semester. So as soon as our office manager says, hey, the bookstore would like you to let us know what your future uh, textbook adoptions are, I just go ahead and reply all and send out a link to that open textbook library to make them aware that there is an archive. And we also want to educate faculty and staff. So an example of educating would be holding a workshop. And it's a really high impact strategy. It does take time to plan and conduct, but the beautiful reality is that the OEN gives you so many resources to feel like you can adopt um, workshops to adapt it yourself so that you can assist faculty in this strategy of awareness, education, and engagement. Because of course, the goal of education is to try and initiate engagement. And that's what we talk about when we think about the workshop strategy. The workshop strategy, again, is really focused on this idea of um, uh, making folks aware of the open textbook library, that there are textbooks to consider, holding a workshop to assist in educating faculty, and also, again, inviting faculty to review. So you can see here how that progression of awareness, 
education and engagement happens by holding workshops with faculty. Not only are you educating and increasing awareness, but you're really encouraging them and offering them an opportunity to review a book in the open textbook library that provides them an opportunity to dig in to see for themselves whether or not they could utilize that book or others for their course. Now, even though we say awareness, education, and engagement. Certainly, it's not linear. You're going to be really moving and working towards lots of different strategies where you're trying to increase awareness, increase engagement, increase education, depending on where your faculty and staff are on an individual and more collective base level. But we know, for example, the open textbook library is really that first strategy of increasing awareness. You know, I often say people don't know what they don't know. And even though I'm acutely aware now of the open textbook library, if I'm really thinking back to when I began as a graduate student or even a faculty member, I had no idea. I'd never heard of open textbooks really, and I certainly didn't know that there was an archive. So when you have faculty and staff ask, okay, where are the open books? You can say, here they are. Um, and there are over 1,500 books across disciplines that is that, that faculty um, can really look and you can increase their awareness about this potential archive. The other thing that can be important is pointing out to faculty and staff that may already have an awareness um, but also educating them by showing them reviews from peers in their field about quality. Because not only will you get the question, where are they as a potential barrier? They might also say, mm, I'm not sure about open. Are they any good? You know, I've heard that it's just folks sitting in their basement. Although I did write my open textbook primarily in my basement, I will, I, I will concede. And we have this kind of um, delusional understanding about whether or not open books are, are any good. So when you're confronted with that barrier, you're able to kind of educate folks and say, here, you can go ahead, dive into different textbooks in your discipline and look at reviews from peers in your field to see what they've said about that particular book. You can see here that this is the kind of overall rankings um, across the uh, books within the open textbook library. Certainly there are some books that have one star, but you can see that there is kind of a lot of books that are within that four to five um, range as well. And so we want to make sure we're giving faculty an opportunity to look at how the reviews are. And we also want to remind faculty that the OEN does not edit any reviews that come in from faculty, that they are honest reviews. They're not just seeking good reviews. Because if a text doesn't live up to an expectation that a field of study might have, then we want other faculty members to know and communicate. And that's kind of what the open textbook reviews really allow and enable. So you're able to help educate them by pointing them to um, just looking at the reviews for themselves. And then we know, for example, that getting faculty to review on their own is a strategy that really works when we think about questions of engagement. Um, I know folks in the OEM have done hundreds I bet thousands of workshops now, in fact. Um, and when they ask faculty, are you thinking about adopting? We can see, for example, that 45% of faculty report yes. And we know also that that 27%, that, that kind of orange, my shirt color here, um, shows that 27% of faculty are a maybe. And that's an important group because as you're holding workshops on your own campus, it is certainly gives you the positive feelings, the good fuzzies to know that potentially 45% of faculty are going to leave with the intention of adopting after engaging with your uh, workshop and review. But it's even more exciting to know that you have 27% of participants where you can reach out to, you can provide support, you can contact to really assist in answering any questions that they might have. But we no, this workshop and corresponding reviews of textbooks are just one way to engage. Um, and so we do that through, of course, the workshop, right, where we're trying to introduce faculty about different barriers that are affecting students and offering open as one possible solution. Like we've mentioned, and I'll show you in a moment here when I give you an overview of the OER adoption workshop, when we invite faculty through awareness and education, to engage with an open textbook for a review, they do. That 74% of faculty, after they complete a workshop on your campus, 
uh, review an actual textbook. And so it's such an important process. Again, when we think about that cycle, fueling back into education and awareness, because holding a workshop not only means you can increase the likelihood that faculty members on your campus will adopt a book, it also increases the likelihood that they're contributing back into those reviews, which assist future faculty members to having a better understanding about what open books are available in their discipline and be able to rely on peers within that discipline to determine the validity and quality of that book for themselves. So um, again, when we talk about our strategy, awareness, education, and engagement, thinking broadly, um, I've given you a couple insight into how those are really practically embedded, but we really want to get an understanding about the things you're doing to try and raise awareness, educate, and engage faculty around open on your own campuses. And so very similar to what we had done um, just about 15 minutes ago, we're first going to ask that you spend about two minutes. Again, in the broader workshop, we usually allow five, but two minutes on your own, again, write down or go ahead and use that activity guide where you reflect on what you already do to raise awareness, to educate faculty about questions of open education. So again, two minutes on your own, and then we'll go ahead and put you back into breakout rooms before I give some additional instructions. Excellent. Now, I will put you in breakout rooms in a moment. I do want to note that if you're not comfortable, if you don't want to participate, it's absolutely okay for you to stay in this room with us. Also, please give me a minute once I do put you in breakout rooms. If I see that you're hanging out solo in a room, I will kind of make that adjustment so that you do have time to chat with one another. But, you know, our goal in this breakout room in 10 minutes, again, we normally give about 15 and the longer train the trainer, is to give you all an opportunity to share the strategies that you listed. So, again, making sure that you're taking note of what really exciting and interesting things other folks in those breakout rooms are using or ideas that they have to use on their own campuses. So I'll give 10 minutes with a few updates within those rooms um, and have a great time chatting about the strategies that you all are each doing. Everyone, welcome back. We'll let the rooms close. If you're coming back, please go ahead, if you're comfortable, to share, share in the chat something that you already do, something that you want to add or try, that perhaps someone else in your breakout room said, something it made you think about. Yes, there is a rubric. So when faculty review, um, they're given a series of categories that they're asked to um, get both kind of quantitative and opportunities for qualitative feedback on those for those reviews. Great question. Welcome back, everyone. I believe we have everyone from the breakout rooms. I hope you had a really great conversation. Um, please, again, go ahead and just share in the chat like we did previously, something that you do to try and engage, educate, um, or increase awareness for faculty and staff on your campus or anything that you had heard that folks in your group had mentioned that they have tried that piqued your interest, something that you want to also write down. Our, fact, our student senate, for example, at KU, they have a faculty textbook award, which is helpful. I think this is part of it, like we mentioned, yes, publicizing successes. So sometimes that can mean very simple things like emailing the chair of a faculty member who may be adopted to try and just even on that, um, that level, make sure you're publicizing. Absolutely, I love that. Participating in the OER certification last spring and being able to kind of offer those other professional developments. There are library guides, I think, are really, really incredible. Again, more resources to point folks to things that are already existing. I think sometimes people have this idea that they have to create the open resource. So these strategies are so great to say, wait a second, not necessarily. Let me help facilitate finding for you places that that work and that legwork has already been done. Stephen, yes, starting small, finding people who are already interested and being able to showcase some of those projects. Even publicizing can mean, um, I know sometimes students have like decorated faculty doors so that other people within their department can see like a thank you. Hey, we really appreciate the focus that you're giving to student success. One-on-one uh, -on -one consultations to help find resources. Absolutely. Cheryl, thank you. The KU Textbook Heroes Program is a great one. I absolutely recommend you all take a look there. 
Adrian, yep, rather than the push approach, meeting staff where they are, really listening to their challenges. I think that's why we start with the barriers in the train, the train, or getting us to think about what are reasons why folks might be really hesitant to adapt so that we can really have that, that idea about what are strategies and responses we can give. An OER committee, amazing, working with student government to promote. Yes, I love the full year of calendar, Amy. So a full year of calendar about programs and activities in advance. We were just talking in the breakout room or when you all were in breakout section sessions, how actually it's just inviting, having a calendar invite that people can put on their calendar um, can be a way to get them to hold that time to be able to meet with you about consultations. A door badge, yes, I love that customized letter. Amazing. You know, I want to encourage you again that as you're looking through these chats to write down the things that you feel like could potentially be options or opportunities. And one of the great things I'm noticing from the chats um, is that the chat is that many of these are very low stakes opportunities to be able to move towards awareness, education, and engagement. So amazing. Amazing. So oh, perfect. Now that you all have some incredible strategies that you all can utilize on your own campuses, we're going to transition um, to talk about a couple reminders, a few key reminders from the OER adoption workshop. Now, many of you perhaps have seen this workshop in full. This is an opportunity, you know, really what we've talked about to um, adapt this workshop on campus with faculty, you know, or staff really to be able to try and provide a narrative, to provide terminology, and to provide some really practical steps when we think about questions of OER adoption. And so I'm not going to do the entire workshop for you, but I am going to give you a few key terms and ideas so that you can, after you're finished with all of OER Engage and you're really planning for your fall semester on campus, you can go to the slide deck for this workshop and be able to think about holding this OER adoption workshop on your own campus. And so the workshop, the goal is to really introduce faculty to issues that students face and to provide open as one possible solution. So um, I'm a communication person. And so it's helpful for me anyway, to give you an idea of the kind of broad overview of the workshop. The workshop is a problem solution format. Um, and my advice is as, as you work to adapt this for yourself is to really spend time in the slide deck, making it your own. So what are your own stories? Um, how can you speak to your own experiences on your own campus with your own communities? So the slide deck is gonna give you an incredible amount of support and an overall narrative that can help you guide faculty members when you're using the workshop on your own campus. But the most successful way to really speak to what faculty are facing on your campus is to adapt the slide deck um, to really reflect your own experiences and the experiences that you think faculty will have. So again, when we're thinking about that workshop, we begin by introducing faculty to a problem. And oftentimes we do that first by asking faculty to really think about the UN Declaration of Human Rights, where higher education will be accessible to all. And oftentimes when I begin the workshop, before I even show this deck, I invite faculty members to share with me their motivation for being um, in higher education. Now, why are you here? I wish it was the money, but that's not what's motivating me every day. And it really gets them to start thinking about some of these broader questions of education. You know, I'm here because I think education can save, can solve community problems. That it's really, really important for empathy, compassion, creative problem solving, critical thinking. And because we have those values in mind, we want to make sure that faculty are overlapping with this idea of accessibility, that we can begin the workshop by saying, this is our overall value. We care about education and we care about having that education be accessible to everyone. So starting with the UN Declaration of Rights helps remind faculty at that value-based level what's motivating us because we can get really bogged down in the weeds, all the other everyday stuff that kind of um, gets moved onto our desk. So when we're able to say, yep, that's why we're here, um, because of that value of education and accessibility, we want to ask, are we living up to that promise of access? You know, what, what, where do we have power to be able to maximize the potential for accessible education for all students? So unfortunately, when we think about living up to that promise, the reality is, you know, we're not really. Um, and so 
this will not be new data for any of us. We know that the cost of education has become burdensome. And we know that cost has shifted to a student, to the responsibility of students on our campuses. And this is the, the University of Minnesota data that highlights the change in the student share of tuition from 1980 to 2022. So what you'll see is that in 1980, about 18 and a half percent of the responsibility for tuition was on students compared now to 51.5% in 2022. You know, for me in Kansas, at the University of Kansas, in 1980, it was 23%. Now we're up to 45% in, ter in terms of that student share. So what you'll do when you think about the application of this workshop on your own campus is to really try and localize. So what are some of the financial issues or burden that students are facing in your state, on your campus, for example, to help highlight that the burden of cost has shifted to students. And also we know that that burden disproportionately affects students with households that come from low to moderate income households. So we're aware of this issue, most often from a tuition standpoint, but we wanna help folks on our campus understand that this isn't just a tuition problem. That we can see, of course, that, the, that tuition, when we think about cost of attending college is high. So this is from the University of Minnesota, for example. Um, where, you know, 16, just over 16 and a half thousand is tuition. And certainly when we talk about access to higher education, we have to acknowledge that college is expensive. And that alone makes it really inaccessible. But when we're thinking about talking to our own faculty, we really want them to understand where they have power and autonomy to affect that financial burden that students are now experiencing. And so again, we want them to understand that we're going to talk about books and supplies that you know, no one is knocking on my door, sadly, to try and solve the tuition crisis in higher education, though I do have ideas. But instead, I have more control and autonomy as a faculty member over the questions of books and supplies. We know, too, that books and supplies matter. So even though we can say, oh, $1,000, well, that's nothing compared to almost 17,000 for tuition. Data tells us, in fact, that that is substantial for the impact that it can have on student success. So we show faculty that data. We know that textbook costs affect students financially. It also affects them academically. This data, I share this data all the time. It's so insightful. Um, what this data is, is um, more than 20,000 students who participated in a textbook, student textbook and course materials survey that was conducted by the Florida Virtual Campus Office of Distance Learning and Student Services. Nice long title. Um, and what happened is students were asked, in your academic career, has the cost of required textbooks caused you to? Now, again, many of you, if you think about that data on the top, 64%, that I didn't purchase the required textbook, we might we might know that, right? Uh, we might know that from our own experience. But, but what we also want to point our attention to are those bottom three numbers that 17% of students failed a course because they weren't able to afford the book. 18% withdrawing and nearly 23% had to drop a course. And this is, the, I find this data particularly important, not only because it really helps tether finances to student success, because if you can't afford the textbook, you cannot afford to participate in the economy of knowledge that's happening within a course. And even if I think to the 64% of not purchasing the required textbook, when I was in college, if I didn't have or couldn't afford the textbook, there were some workarounds, some strategies I could use. I could borrow a book from a friend. I could go to the library course reserve. Those are some things I could do. But now, with the increased use of access codes where students have to purchase that one code, oftentimes it means that's where they also access all of their quizzes and assignments, then they lose access to that content afterwards. Not purchasing, not being able to have your individual copy of a book can have disastrous consequences. So this data is important not only because it highlights that connection, it tethers finances to student success, it's also important for faculty, for me, when showing them this data to say, hey, if anything is happening on your campus like it's happening on mine, there is an extreme amount of pressure to, to minimize drop, fail, withdrawal rates within our courses. So you're really able to use this data to say, hey, having expensive and inaccessible textbooks can also affect 
student's ability to drop, to withdraw, or to fail in courses. And if we address that barrier, it might assist in also speaking that administrative language about student enrollment numbers within our courses. So one of the things that's important in the workshop, a kind of detail, is of course this question of financial barriers that students face. But more and more in workshops, we're doing, we're doing additional labor to focus on something else that students are experiencing, which is a sense of belonging in the classroom. So you could really think about um, issues of inequality and issues of social injustice that students are facing. And, and this is taught, you know, called the kind of sense of belonging. And you can see the quote here reads, racially minoritized and first generation students at four year institutions are less inclined to feel that same sense of belonging compared to peers at their two year institutions. So we've talked a little bit about students having to shoulder the burden of tuition costs and textbook costs and the impact that that has on their student success. But we also want to think about the psychological or sometimes um, psychic messages that we send to students in terms of who belongs and who does not belong based on the need to pay expensive tuition and buy a hundred dollar textbook, especially when that textbook content doesn't reflect any faces that look like theirs, any geographic locations where they came from. So these financial barriers and inability to see themselves in the curriculum can have a direct impact on students' sense of belonging, particularly those who come from marginalized backgrounds. I think about this as students who have access to the rules of the game, right? Who know the hidden curriculum, things like where they can borrow a textbook, who they can ask if they need assistance or if they can't afford that book. Um, all of the examples that they see about your disciplinary content are those experiences that they've had. All of those contribute to a sense of belonging. And students without that knowledge often fail to be included, which can have short and long-term consequences for them and for our programs and our institutions because they feel like they don't belong. You know, I wanna acknowledge that these questions of belonging can feel a little less direct than the financial barriers. I am and was a white student whose parent was a professor. I was given access to the hidden curriculum, but many others are not. And we know that there's evidence that marginalized folks have difficulty succeeding in college. So yes, the problem is financial. Yes, it reduces student success. Yes. And we want to investigate the kinds of educational legacy and flexibility that traditional education resource models provide versus what open solutions can provide to also confront this issue of that sense of belonging. Because these students may feel like they aren't seen in the classroom and your and curricular materials, educational materials are part of that experience in the classroom. So while there's more within the full OER adoption slide deck, right, this is the kind of conclusion of the problem part of, the, of engaging with, with faculty members. Um, and, and we want to then kind of transition to, all right, now that we uh, have a better understanding of challenges students face, why and how is open a potential solution? And one of the best ways, in my experience, that we can help faculty understand open as a solution is to help them understand that there are already models of open that have existed for years and years and years. Again, folks don't know what they don't know, but often I, I've, I've realized that when I talk about the open textbook that I wrote, I'm working on the second edition now, oftentimes faculty, colleagues, and my peers have no understanding about how the open um, process might work. So showing them this model is helpful. Where on the left-hand side, here's often how that traditional model of publishing works, where you have a publisher you know, who invests in a textbook, the students pay for that investment, and then the authors receive just a little tiny, tiny minuscule amount of a royalty um, to support their efforts. But the model on the right really helps folks understand that an open model exists and has been successful, where rather than a publisher, often what happens is a college or university. So in my case, KU Libraries provided me with a grant and support to be able to write a book. So they invest in the author to assist in creating that book and students pay back nothing. So again, this is incredibly helpful. And increasingly we see institutions of higher education like UMass Amherst, or even KU and others who are funding these open textbook projects because they recognize the value that those books bring. And the publishing process may be 
the very, very same as the traditional model, including things like copy editing and peer review, but the outcomes are different because students can download and keep that book forever for free. It's important to talk about the business model with faculty because it lays out a reasonable way for an openly licensed textbook to be funded, and it destigmatizes the idea that free equates with an inferior product, or somehow, again, only means self-publishing books without any editing, hanging out in our basement, <laughs> writing those books. Um, and again, we don't know what we don't know, so showing that model can be helpful. We also want faculty to understand that part of this model does include questions of kind of copyright, because when we talk about open, we mean open means free plus certain permissions. And so we help faculty understand that um, oftentimes when we think about permissions, depending on what the author has communicated, using Creative Commons instead of traditional copyright, which is insufficient since it would require students to pay for the license for each copy, that Creative Commons instead enables more of an opportunity to address the barriers that we talked about with faculty in that problem model, which is um, that you can't, students can copy that, share it, they can keep it, and they can use it forever. And based on certain Creative Commons licensees, it also means that you might have an opportunity to create a derivative or to edit or to mix or remix one or multiple um, OERs or open textbooks together to create something that you might need. So open provides an opportunity not only to reduce the financial barrier for students, but also it allows and enables you, one, as faculty members to select texts um, and to edit or remix them. I often find that it can be helpful for to, to tell faculty, hey, you know how sometimes when you adopt a book that's $150 and you know there are about six chapters in that book you don't wanna use, but you still assign it, you still sort of spend time on it in class because you feel like students should get out of the book what they put in through money. You no longer have those burdens anymore. Just what a, what, what's the, the the, a square peg in a round hole, right? If that OER does not meet the needs of the learning outcomes in your course, or you have the opportunity based on the Creative Commons license to do a bunch of other cool things with it, which could include custom um, customizing the content or contextualizing that content. So if you are using a book that was written on the East Coast and you teach on the West Coast, you might just wanna update the examples so that the West Coast examples speak more to students' experiences, for example. You can also think more about questions of inclusion. So maybe there's an open book that you love, but you're realizing that um, there needs to be better representative sample of examples, of photos, of videos that really speak to who your students are. And those enable opportunities for innovative pedagogy op options like working with students to create content or even collaborating or, or, or asking faculty co to collaborate with graduate students to assist in creating pedagogical opportunities. So really there's so much you can do with a Creative Commons license, um, which can address some of the questions that we talked about in the problem, um, through that problem model. So again, when we think about why, why open, we want faculty to understand, yes, it removes the financial barrier for all students. It can facilitate the free exchange of knowledge because you don't lose access. So if you're trying to recruit students to a major, you can tell them, hey, when you take an introductory course, you're gonna have that textbook for the advanced course that you have to take a year later. You're not gonna lose access. It can help give more control to faculty as they think about adapting, editing, and adjusting content that meets the specific learning goals of their courses. Again, it can be used for questions of innovative pedagogy. It's also scalable. You're able to share what you've created on a global scale. That's been one of the coolest things I've seen with my open textbook is how many people in other countries are able to access the content that otherwise would be ex um, exclusion, exclusionary and they wouldn't be able to access. So this is the pitch, the time in the workshop where we pitch the faculty about what they can do. This is that transition from awareness and education to engagement. So we want them to take a look, go into that open textbook library and see a book that maybe you could potentially use, and then you're going to write a review. 
it's often really a great opportunity on your campus when you do a workshop to think about any ways you can incentivize faculty to complete that review. So that might mean a financial incentive. Um, maybe it means like a cookie, any kind of incentive as you think about ways to get sort of faculty to review. And then we also want them to adopt it if it meets the needs of their students. And we want them to continue to use the strategies that, that we've been introducing today raising awareness, talking to other colleagues. Um, and I think all of those, these are great opportunities to again, kind of keep that sort of cycle of awareness, education and engagement going. So like I mentioned, this is not the full, this, this kind of was not the full OER um, engagement workshop. They often run anywhere from about 60 to 90 minutes. But I am so confident that every single one of you would be able to take that workshop deck to make it your own and to really encourage faculty to think about reviewing and adopting. I want you to remember 74% of faculty review textbooks at the completion of the workshop. So if you think about different strategies and impact ROI of the strategies that you're using, there are really few strategies that can assist faculty in engaging and getting kind of in the thick of it than using the workshop on your campus. Now, when we talk about open with faculty, we want to remember that a key factor in overcoming barriers is being open to hard questions and skeptics. Um, I think it can also cause many of us the most anxiety. When I began to do this work, I remember thinking, oh my gosh, I'm gonna get a question I'm not gonna know. I have so many questions, <laughs> right? Um, but, uh, remember that folks in academia, faculty, they're trained to ask tough questions. It's what they do. And for some faculty, um, you know, this, this idea of a traditional textbook using a traditional publisher has been normalized and naturalized for much of their career. And so they should have questions. Um, and you want them to ask the questions to you so that you have an opportunity to answer rather than keeping them kind of all hauled up um, and then deciding that they're not going to engage or think about open. And so we want to think about these tough questions as opportunities, um, as ways that things that we can plan for. And that's really going to what, what we're going to kind of spend the last little bit of our time together doing. We have just a couple of tips to remember if you are going to get any tough questions is try not to demonize. There may be some questions that you think are just absolutely ridiculous. I can't believe someone would ask me this question. Um, but as that reminder, not to demonize. There's no need to sell. You don't work for the you know big open publisher by any means. Right? We're just starting conversations with faculty members. It's also absolutely okay to say, I don't know. In many ways, I think it's so much better to tell faculty, I'm not quite sure I really want to get some accurate information and data from you, rather than give an answer that you think could be true um, and could, in fact, actually diminish your credibility. So it could have long-term impacts on their ability to re-engage with some of these questions. And then again, um, I think the, the thing that's always been so helpful for me to remember, which the OEN is always reminding me, is again, our goal is not to sell a certain amount of faculty on open. The goal is to let faculty be the judge. And the beautiful part of letting faculty be the judge is that data shows us that just having those open and honest conversations with faculty lead them in the direction of reviewing and adopting. Because in many ways, like many of us know, it makes sense for the issues and problems that our students are facing. So I'm gonna switch back to Cheryl as we think about practicing answering tough questions. Thanks, Maggie. Yeah, so if you haven't gotten a tough question yet from a skeptic or a critic, um, you, you will. <laughs> I remember being called into an administrator's office who had read a story about how our local community college was adopting the OER and they were concerned and, and wanted to know what is this OER stuff. Um, that's when I kept uh, print copies of OpenStax books to hand to the skeptics and say, look, here's an example. And inevitably, they would say, oh, this is a real textbook. And then we could have a conversation about, yes, it is. Um, anyway, so um, next slide, please. 
it's important to practice. I remember when I was doing my very first workshop and I got some tough questions from faculty about the peer review process, I'm sure I looked like a deer in headlights. So, um, you know, I'm sure I got flustered. So taking the time to, to practice these common questions, and just like there are common barriers, there are common questions that come up um, during these trainings and workshops. So practicing will help you feel more comfortable or confident in how to respond and and in and, and just dealing with um, faculty, students, administrators, even your boss. All right, so next slide, please. So for this part, Miggy and I are going to exchange roles. She is going to um, play the OER, OER program administrator, and I'm going to play a faculty member. And she is going to at first give me her very worst possible answer. I know this is not how <laughs> Mickey would answer in real life, um, but um, so I, I'm just going to throw this question out there. I hear these books aren't any good. Is the quality the same as other textbooks? I, mean, I did see and review the book you're currently using, so I know that these are going to be higher quality than what you've already decided to adopt. So yeah, I think they're they're going to be way better than anything you've already used. So I'll throw this out to you in, in, to respond to you in the chat. Do you see anything potentially problematic with that response? I'll say that I've learned the hard way not to make assurances about quality. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I know that's not the answer Maggie would give. Uh, so I'll give her an opportunity to, to give her real answer. I hear these books aren't any good. Is the quality the same as other textbooks? Cheryl, I'm so glad that you asked this question. It's such an important one. Um, I would love to show you the Open Textbook Library link and give you an opportunity to see what books are available in your area and to review, um, look, take a look at reviews that other faculty have already given to those books so that you yourself can be the judge. Do you, do you feel the difference between those two responses and how faculty are likely to respond to those two responses? Uh, if we go on to the next slide and in advance, um, you know, in the second response, Maggie did uh, several things really well. Um, encouraging engagement, you know, encourage them to look at the reviews in the open textbook library. Um, you know, relying on a faculty member's expertise rather than the OER program coordinator saying, oh, this is a really high quality book. As I'm not the subject matter expertise, I don't know the scope or the sequence or the learning objectives. So I have learned not to make any kind of quality determinations. It's really up to the faculty member and their expertise to see if a piece of OER would work for them. And, and acknowledging that this is a good question. Um, and encouraging that dialogue about, you know, because this is a question that's really common, uh, the, the whole quality question. People have suspicions about free stuff. You know, if it were so great, why are you giving it away for free? Um, all right. Um, in the next slide, we want to give you a chance to start drafting your own answer to the quality question. Because if you haven't gotten it yet, <laughs> I can almost virtually assure you that you will at some point. Uh, so you can either use the activity guide that you downloaded or just a blank piece of paper or your device and, and think through how you would respond in a way that feels natural and comfortable to you uh, if you got that, that challenging question. I know you'd probably like more time to work on this. I, I do encourage you to, to keep adding to this and refining your response um, just so that you, you know, can kind of quickly um, respond in a way that feels comfortable and meaningful and authentic to you. Uh, we're not gonna share these. Um, we, we were talking offline. I saw the question in the chat about the, um, 
the elevator pitches and we were talking offline during one of the breakout rooms about a way to um, share a set of elevator pitches. It's one of the activities that we do in the certificate for open education librarianship. And I had mentioned in the chat that I actually got to use mine when I was invited to the president's house as a senator. And he went around the room and said, OK, everybody tell me in in just a couple minutes how we can improve student success. <laughs> and I thought, All right, this is my chance to pitch OER. Uh, so, yeah, you may find yourself with an opportunity to <laughs> to actually use your elevator pitch, but it's it's a useful exercise to go through. All right, so let's go on to the next slide. And the next question, um, how do I find time to adopt an open textbook? Uh, for this one, Maggie, I'll, I'll skip your really bad answer. <laughs> I, in previous workshops, you've come up with some very creative bad answers. Uh, <laughs> But um, how would how would you actually respond to this question? Again, another really, really important question. I know that you're, as a faculty member, constantly being asked to do more with less. So as you're thinking about adopting a new textbook in your next cycle, let me know and I'd be happy to help take a look or give you some suggestions um, whenever that, that kind of cycle comes around. I'm, again, happy to provide support as well. Great answer. And if we can go to the next slide, we'll unpack that a little bit. Um, I think it, yeah, there we go. Yeah, um, it, it does take time to adopt an open textbook and revise your syllabus. So um, offering that support, a one-on-one -on -one consultation, uh, you know, maybe doing a preliminary search of available options, um, that's really valuable to faculty. And um, you know, encourage them to maybe pilot. Pilot's one of my favorite words because it can feel like a big lift to completely overhaul your course, but maybe just try uh, one piece of OER as uh, maybe a supplemental reading, see how the students react to it, and then build from there. So those incremental approaches are are ways that you can encourage and uh, respond to to faculty. I think just acknowledging that you know they're busy, they have a lot of demands on their time, and um, you know making them aware that we're we're here to support them. If you have instructional design support or consultations available, um, I think all of those things are really good to bring up in these conversations. All right. Um, what do you think, Maggie? Do we have time to do another breakout? Or should we just skip that and move on to the... Normally, we would break here and do a 15-minute session. Um, let's see, we've got about 25 minutes left. Should we... What if we just talk through answers to some of the potential questions collectively? How does that sound? That sounds good. Yeah. So what we usually do in the breakout, oop, if you can just go back one more slide, is encouraging people to to practice really not just talk theoretically about how they might approach it, but really, you know, when you're faced with that question, how would you respond? It's different thinking about what you might say than actually practicing it. And then um, the other important part is um, for the others in the breakout room to provide you know, constructive feedback on how that message was received and what it might be done to improve it. Um, when we did this in one exercise, you know, I thought I had a good response for faculty and a faculty member actually was participating and said, that would not resonate with me. <laughs> and so that's really helpful feedback to know uh, what would resonate with faculty and um, what would what would they be receptive to hearing? So um, I think that's a great exercise to adapt for trainings that you might do for instructional designers or liaison librarians or you know others who are involved in OER programs. Uh, okay, we, now we can go on to the other possible questions. Um, so these uh, come up quite a bit about the availability of print on demand. 
what about ancillary materials? You know, I'm used to using that publisher course in a box. I really need those slide decks and those PowerPoints and the test banks and uh, the courseware. So, um, you know, having being ready to address what's available out there. And if you haven't um, been doing a deep dive in the open textbook library lately, um, be aware that they now link to any available ancillary materials in the open textbook library, which is a fantastic improvement. Uh, you know, in, in Maggie's training, she addressed who writes the open textbooks and how do they get paid? Um, you know, ad addressing the question, are you gonna try to force us to use a certain textbook? And really talking about academic freedom and how OER expand faculty's academic freedom by giving them additional options. They don't have to use the chapters in the order that the publisher decided. They can rearrange them and cut some out and add in their own content. Um, so really empowers faculty. And, uh, you know, these these tips are here as well. Again, on not demonizing, being okay with saying, I don't know, but I'll get back to you and, uh, and letting faculty be the judge. I think there's one more question on the next slide, um, which is a growing question on a lot of campuses about inclusive access and equitable access. And uh, there are resources out there like inclusiveaccess.org to help people. Um, I was on a task force years ago for the Open Education Network that developed some talking points um, to, to use, um, you know, and uh, personally, the way I answer this question is uh, that, and I have inclusive access on my campus, and I have an equitable access style program on my campus. And our bookstore is fortunately campus owned and a fabulous partner in all of our uh, course material affordability options. So, um, you know, it, for me, it's already there. So it's it's a reality that I have to deal with. I know others of you are, are looking at, you know, how, and I encourage you to always have a seat at the table for these conversations that are happening with bookstores and other units. Always try to get a seat at the table so that you know, if inclusive access does come or equitable access, you can help shape it. And that was the approach that we took um, was to make it as student friendly as possible. And, uh, you know, I look at it as one tool in our affordability toolbox. It's not the one <laughs> that I start with. I always encourage faculty to start by looking at OER and then other free to use resources. But you know, if none of those work for a faculty member, then inclusive access and equitable access are um, things that we can use. And uh, our bookstore does a good job of negotiating discounts up to 50%. So um, yeah, that's my approach to, to this question. Oh, yep. And yeah, focusing on academic freedom, and uh, in, in thanking faculty, I think, for taking um, course material affordability into account and, uh, you know, the, how the textbook costs impact student success, all of those things are good things to talk with faculty about. All right, so we've got about 20 minutes left and uh, this is an amazing group of people. So. Um, I want to ask what questions you have, and I hope that others, um, you can either unmute yourself or you can type your question in the chat. There's a wealth of knowledge in this room and uh, in this Zoom room, and so I would love to hear others chime in too with their expertise uh, on any questions that people have. I really appreciate all of the suggestions that have been shared in the chat and the resources. Uh, I'm trying to catch up with the chat here. Let's see. Ah, yeah. Uh, Anne Marie mentions not offering, not often getting offered a seat at the table. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, sometimes we can't 
wait to be invited. Sometimes we have to, uh, yes, show up and bring our own chair and insist on having a seat at the table. It's a very good point. Yep. Ah, okay. I see a question about the 1500 textbooks available in the open textbook library. How many of those are available in other libraries? How many are unique? Uh, you know, there are multiple referatories out there um, between uh, the Pressbooks directory and uh, OER Commons, Merlot, LibreTexts. So I don't know how many of those titles are unique, but I know that when I search these different referatories, I do get different results. Ah, excellent. I see, I knew somebody would have an answer to this. Anne-Marie, um, this is fabulous. I've never seen this. The comparison chart from the Midwest Higher Education Compact. Thank you so much for sharing that. Yeah, um, I, you know, I just personally as a practice when I'm doing a one on one consultation with faculty, I, I the open open textbook library is the first place I look and then the press books directory because we can clone things on our press books network Libre texts. Um, we have the Oasis uh, search widget embedded in our find OER page on our library website. And uh, uh, SUNY Geneseo has provided the widget code for you to embed in um, libguides or websites. So that can be really helpful. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie, for sharing that, that resource. Ah, and Amy um, points out, yes, this really um, great white paper that Nathan Smith from Houston Community College recently shared about the, the you know, does inclusive access and equitable access um, benefit students? Thank you for sharing that link. Uh, Sarah points out, um, you know, agreeing with the incremental approaches uh, is there anything you've already created that you could publish as OER? Fantastic question. Yeah, so many faculty have already created all of these resources for their courses and don't really realize, um, you know, that they could share them openly. Um, for us, this has involved some questions about how sharing course materials with an open license interacts with our university's intellectual property policy because while faculty at the University of Arizona um, hold the, the copyright to their scholarship, our Board of Regents holds the copyright to their course materials. And so having discussions to make sure they're aware of, you know, they also have rights to their course materials, of course, but, um, you know, ha encouraging them to have a conversation with our Tech Transfer Center or Tech Lodge Arizona. Um, about open licenses uh, and knowing what your campus's intellectual property policy are, are good strategies. Uh, Sarah says her sense is that most OERs are cross-listed in multiple places. Yeah, the, uh, the peer reviews um, are a major value add, you know, and it really helps answer that quality question if you can point to, look, these are reviews that follow a really detailed 10 category rubric. People have spent a lot of time on these reviews and these are subject matter experts in your field. You might recognize some of your peers' names and um, you know see what they think. Ah, uh, uh, Sarah points out, someone on the IT side, yes. <laughs> The chat, the um, the IT challenges of implementing inclusive access in the learning management system. Uh, we have had a lot of challenges. Um, yep, 
that have had to be worked out. Um, I'll, I'll say that for our OER program, we have worked with our bookstore to embed unlimited user uh, library licensed ebooks and OER alongside um, the inclusive and equitable access titles in the Vital Source bookshelf. So, you know, that's an option too to make sure that students can have easy access to the free materials that are being provided. And our, you know, we encourage faculty to keep choosing the OER and the library licensed ebooks because our bookstore took those numbers into account when they were calculating the cost of our equitable access style program, which I insisted that they rename. I said, don't call it equitable access. So we call ours pay one price. I, Sally asked, do OER have ISBN numbers or some other tracking number and identification? They can. Um, they can have ISBN numbers. Some have um, digital object identifiers. Uh, it just depends on who published them. Um, but that's that's definitely uh, something that libraries often support authors in adding to the textbook. Ah, OK. Amy mentions about the uh, whether the the number like, is overwhelming to faculty. OK, that's a good point. And that's why I think, um, yeah, that that one on one help where you can use your skills as a as a librarian or, or instructional designer or faculty member to kind of help faculty winnow down the options. Um, you know, I'll, I'll say that I've also, when OER aren't an option and we direct faculty to uh, library licensed ebooks, I found it's helpful to um, also give them relevant search terms that they can search in our, uh, our catalog system, because I've learned that faculty may, they may know exactly what they want, but they, may have a difficult time kind of describing what that looks like. So I've spent hours looking for what the faculty member shared that they wanted. And uh, they came back and said, no, no, you know, what you found isn't quite it. But when I shared the search uh, terms, the subject terms with them, um, they immediately found <laughs> exactly what they were looking for. So um, using a combination of tactics, I think. Okay, another another response from Tanya about the overlap um, between the Open Textbook Library and uh, and other places. I'll I'll say one thing I really appreciate about the Open Textbook Library is that um, they limit the number of versions that are there. Um, I like the Pressbooks directory a lot, but I do find that I sometimes find a lot of different versions for the same title. Um, some seem to be kind of still works in progress. And so with the Open Textbook Library, these are finished books. Um, they're limited to the most recent version. And, uh, and I think um, browsing and searching are, are good strategies using the, the subject categories to browse just to catch those titles that a search may not turn up. Ah, Jacob notes that his university currently provides all students with required textbooks for their courses. OK. And that, oh, but the president is look, looking at getting rid of the program. Do you have any particular suggestions for approaching conversations with the highest levels of administration about integrating OERs as a replacement? It's unclear why the president wants to get rid of the current program. OK. Yeah, I, I think it's definitely worth having a conversation with your, with your uh, administration and your bookstore about other solutions and what works best for faculty you know, protecting academic freedom. Um, but that day one access for students is so critical. And, uh, you know, OER, a good way to provide that. 
library license materials can be a good way to provide that. Um, and, you know, honestly, our pay one price, um, that's a big selling point for students that they they just have that day one access. They don't have to do the shopping. The cost is added to their bursar account and they can use financial aid to pay for it. So, yeah, I think finding out, you know, the concerns about the program, is it too difficult? Are they concerned about the change in the Department of Education rules that will could possibly change inclusive and equitable access programs from opt out to opt in. Um, yeah, that would be a great conversation to have. And as as Maggie points out, uh, there's more great data and talking points in the slide deck. Okay, I see Sarah noting about, um, you know, the, the opt out issue. Um, and Honestly, some programs have told me that they intentionally make it difficult for students to opt out. I that is not a best practice. That is not in students' best interests. And I appreciate how our our bookstore, our campus store, um, really goes out of its way to repeatedly email students and let them know how to opt out if they think that's what's best for them. Oh, and Jamie shared the criteria for submitting um, to the Open Textbook Library. Thank you. Yeah, that is helpful. Um, one of the key criteria is that it needs to be in a downloadable format. Um, so that's what's tripped up some of our authors. They've had to go back and um, add that downloadable option in their press book before it can be accepted into the Open Textbook Library. I appreciate Amy's comment about, you know, the interesting scenario, the national conversation is more about switching to these IA, EA programs, and and you're asking about switching away. And she makes a good point about um, mandates. Um, you know, there, there have been some attempts to mandate OER use, and those have not gone over well, to say the least. Uh, there was a legislator in Hawaii who thought it would be a good idea to mandate OER use, and uh, you know that that faculty academic freedom is is uh, so important to preserve. Um, but just making faculty aware that OER is an option, I think, is a really important part of our jobs and helping connect them with it. Oh, good. Tanya shared more resources in the community hub. Excellent. Um, let's see, Maggie, let's move on to the next slide. Um, thinking about what steps you are going to take. Um, I have attended the National Association of College Stores Textbook Affordability Conference for the last several years, which is a really cool conference to get insights into the campus store world. Um, the inclusive and equitable access are the primary topics at those conferences. Uh, and it's been helpful as a librarian to attend those and, and get some insights. We attend with our campus store personnel, so it helps build that partnership as well. But one of the things that conference does on the last day is has you fill out a postcard to yourself saying, OK, this is what I promised myself I'm going to do when I get back because they know that we go to these workshops and these conferences and get fired up. We hear all these fantastic ideas and then we get busy with email and and calls and meetings and uh, forget about what we we vowed to do or forgot about that great link to explore later. Um, so I just want to uh, let's see if we advance to the next slide. Yeah, just on your own for a couple minutes. Um, reflect on one next step that you can take. Um, if you have time, you know, write down more, but a lot of people have shared great resources in the chat. Um, with the um, Tanya and, and Barb and, and others, is there a way to save the chat? I'm not seeing that. Yes, we can. Okay, so we'll... Okay, 
Fantastic. Yeah, if there's a way that we can save the chat and maybe share out these resources later, uh, I think that would be super helpful. All right, next slide, please, Maggie. Uh, typically, when we do this as a three hour workshop, we'll have people share in the chat. We're going to we're going to skip this, but um, let's go on to the next slide. Um, I, I do encourage you to, uh, you know, you don't have to mail this postcard to yourself like the, the textbook affordability conference does, but, you know, add it to your calendar, put it somewhere, stick it as a sticky note on your, your monitor, just so that um, you, you do follow up um, on some of the ideas that you've heard today. And I also encourage you to celebrate your wins. That's a really important part of this work. Um, you're doing such important and such valuable work. Uh, you know, it, it can feel sometimes like we're, it's going more slowly than we want it to go. So really celebrate all of your wins. And now I'll hand things back to Tanya to close us out. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you, Maggie. Uh, we really appreciate you sharing your vast experience with us um, in this whole world of OER. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, if today's session sparked ideas, questions, or thoughts, we encourage you to continue the conversation in the OEN Google group, or feel free to reach out to our team. The biggest thing I hear is, well, I don't know if it's an important enough question to post in the Google group. Uh, please don't feel that way. Just post in the Google group, because if you have the question, my guess is that several others do. So that's uh, the best way for us to spark uh, for future conversation. Um, also, we do have a space for continued discussion about this topic at today's session um, at 1245 Central Time entitled Tips and Best Practices for Hosting the Intro to OER Adoption Workshops. And I always get a lot of great practices from this session, so please join us if you're interested. Finally, we want to remind you that this session has been recorded and will be shared with you via email and posted to the Community Hub in the coming weeks. The slides and chat transcripts will also be linked. So thanks again, um, everybody, for joining us, and we hope that you have a great rest of the day. Bye.